Welcome back to the Rich Eisen Show. All high-quality sports agents know about the power of branding. So my guest sitting here in the Rich Eisen Show studio wearing a professional Fighters Association golf shirt <laughs> understands the power of branding. A pleasure to see longtime baseball sports agent Jeff Boris. Good to see you, sir. How are you? Thanks for having me on. You me. bet. So uh, before we get to the uh, Professional Fighters Association, before we get to the, the, the reason why you are here, uh, players that you have represented over the past 30 years as a sports agent? Baseball, 30 years. 30 years. Uh, Barry Bonds, yes. Ricky Henderson, yes. uh, Jose Canseco. Yes. Yes. And you've lived to tell the tales for all these people. This yes. is fantastic. Uh, Saberhagen, Brett Saberhagen, yes. right? Gentlemen, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, Jeff, we have met the person who is still collecting a percentage of checks for Bobby Bonilla's professional baseball career. Yeah, his deferred compensation runs actually 25 years, so he's still going to be collecting checks for quite, quite some time. You are the agent who came up with this this idea or that you were the one who saw, helps this Bobby Bo sign the deal where Bobby Bo's getting paid by the Mets still today. Yes, it was my partner, Dennis Gilbert at the time. And oh, myself Dennis Gilbert. Did sure. Mm -hmm. Dennis, who I see behind home plate of uh, Dodger stadium almost every single night. He's every sitting game. back there. He's sitting back there. Yeah. Okay. So you, you've got all these years of, of experience in major league baseball. And thus I imagine with players and the player union as well. This is where the, this is where you were, I guess, um, desire to do what you want to do with the UFC is coming from, Jeff? Well, I, I've worked closely with the Major League Baseball Players Union for the last 30 years, and I think that they're the gold standard as far as sports unions are concerned, mm -hmm. that the rights of the baseball players are light years ahead of every other sport. And when I got exposed to the UFC uh, for the very first time and how they conduct their business, what their culture is over there, I said it's practically impossible that these fighters don't have a union and that sooner or later it would be inevitable that that would happen. And I think that we're the group that I put together, we're at the right time and the right place in order to do that. Okay. So why do you say baseball players union is the gold standard of, of unions? And to, it just, is it because they have kept the salary cap out of baseball, essentially? Is that, is that where you're going with that one? Well, it's a result of having a lot of different wars with ownership, and it's taken some time. But I think it's the unity of the baseball players that has kept them together during those wars, mm -hmm. and that's why their rights are ahead of all the other sports. Okay. So when you went, how did you first get associated with the UFC fighters in, in general, Jeff? Well, I'm of counsel to the Balanchy Group, which is a sports agency based out of Dallas. And it was January, February, when I was doing the baseball salary arbitration cases for them, which mm -hmm. is the time of year when that occurs. Mm -hmm. And Lloyd Pearson at the Balanchy Group came up to me. He had just negotiated the Diaz-McGregor first bout. Mm -hmm. That was UFC 196. And he said, would you take a look at these contracts for me and see if anything jumps off the page at you, if anything's glaring? I got my red pen out, and I started looking at the contracts. And I, I literally couldn't get through the first paragraph without seeing things in there that were unenforceable, not valid. Like and, what? Just, just all sorts of stuff. Like when you talk about, uh, let's say, their publicity section, they, they tell the fighters for an upcoming fight, you have to do anything and everything they tell you to do whenever and wherever they want as far as publicity for a fight. Now, they sh they're entitled to something, maybe three appearances, maybe two radio commercials or something like that. But to just have it unlimited at their discretion, whatever and whenever they want, there was that dispute with Conor McGregor when they wanted him to come in from Iceland yes, for a did. press conference. That's a long way to travel for a press conference than to get on an airplane and turn back and fly, fly back home. So I, it's things like that which are just patently offensive. Uh, I'm not saying that Conor was in the right or Conor was in the wrong by not showing up for something like that, but these things need to be negotiated and there needs to be some sort of inherent fairness within their contract. Well, but and, and I'm here with Jeff Boris, longtime sports agent who has uh, created the Professional Fighters Association trying to unionize the UFC right here on the Rich Eisen Show. Should we, though, take as an indication just, just this first order of business that you and I are unpacking right here from the contract about appearances leading up to a fight, the fact that the UFC went ahead and sidelined Conor McGregor, of all people, over it, Shouldn't we give that as an indication that you've got a major uphill battle on your hands right here, Jeff? I, I wouldn't necessarily say an uphill battle because when I started this, I thought that first I would have to educate the fighters on all the things that they're not getting that they should be entitled to, such as minimums, pensions, a collectively bargained for drug policy, a grievance procedure, the medical insurance, things like that. 
But I'm finding that part of the job to be very easy. I think that the fighters all know that. They understand that. They all know that they need that. I think where the battle is coming in is they feel intimidated. They feel intimidated by the UFC because they say, hey, listen, I want to join the union, but I don't want to be the poster boy for the effort. I don't want the UFC to retaliate against me. You know, it's taken me a long time to work to get to this position where I'm in right now, and I don't want the UFC to yank me off a card or do whatever they want because I'm the poster boy for the union. I'm all on board for it, but uh, right now, don't, don't mention my name or anything. So I've, I've promised all the fighters that I've talked to I will keep them all anonymous for the time being mm -hmm. until I get over at least 500 solicitation cards signed. Um, Leslie Smith is the only one who's been brave enough up to this point mm -hmm. to come forward. She's done some interviews regarding it. So she's the only name that I mentioned, and, and I applaud her for her bravery because she's not a fear of the reprisals from the UFC. But other fighters, that's the common theme that I've noticed, that they're afraid of the UFC. When we come back, I'm going to take a quick 60-second break. When I come back, uh, I assume you've spoken to Dana White. Yes? Yeah, yes. Oh, okay. That's coming up next here on The Rich Eisen Show with Jeff Boris talking about uh, the next steps, if there are, that uh, can be taken uh, to get this thing done. Jeff Boris here uh, of the Professional Fighters Association on The Rich Eisen Show. Welcome back to The Rich Eisen Show. News out of Denver that uh, Trevor Simeon is not throwing today due to a sore shoulder, so he might not. Uh, maybe it's just a taking a day off, but uh, it's a very fluid situation atop the flow chart for the Denver Broncos quarterbacks as they are 15 days away from uh, getting set to, well, 16 days away from getting set to start the NFL season against the Carolina Panthers. I've got Jeff Boris, longtime sports agent and attorney of the uh, Professional Fighters Association here on the Rich Eisen Show. Okay, so now um, – when you decide to say, I'm ready to, to try this thing, you pick up the phone and call Dana White or you at the UFC? Is that how this thing gets started? How do you start unpeeling this, this apple right here? Well, what happened is after uh, Lloyd Pearson negotiated the McGregor-Diaz yes. bout, he said, I have a meeting at their headquarters in Las Vegas with Dana White and Lorenzo Fertitta. Would you like to join me? And? So I said, sure. So I went out there to Vegas for the meeting and... I couldn't help myself at some point. I said to, to Dana in the meeting, I said, how come these fighters haven't unionized? And then he just said, one, they're independent contractors. That'll never happen. They're not employees. And they would lose their, their right to independently negotiate their deals and whatever. And I said, that's not true. I said that, you know, when you look at all the other sports, baseball, basketball, football, hockey, soccer, they all have individual agents that negotiate their own deals individually. And they're all part of a union. And he scoffed at the idea. And when we walked out of there, I turned to Lloyd and I said, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to unionize these guys. Why did you have that sense on the spot? Why did you want to do something like that? Because did I just don't like the way that they're conducting their business over there. I just think that they are trampling on the fighters' rights. That I mean, you see guys like the Diaz-McGregor fight this last weekend. They're making millions of dollars. That's great. They're at the pinnacle of their sport. But the masses of these fighters are not at the same level that McGregor and Diaz are at. And they're really being taken advantage of. And when you look at all the other major sports, I think like something like this is inevitable. The sale just occurred. I think the timing is, is perfect, and it has to happen now. So before the sale, though, did you speak to Dana White about this and or anybody in the UFC? Or no, not really? Yeah, this was in January, February, and the sale, people say to me, would you have done this if the sale wasn't occurring? And right. I said, Said, yes, I, I would have done it anyway. Okay, so now that the sale's gone through, what's have you spoken to the new owners, if you will, of the UFC? Well, I've reached out. I reached out to Dana, and he said he knew nothing of the movement, and he was asked that question at a press conference. I then reached out to Patrick Whitesell and Ari Emanuel over at William Morris. Yeah. I got a hold of Whitesell's assistant who said, just send me an email and pass along the information. I spoke to Ari on the phone. It was very brief. He hung up on me, said he didn't want to have anything to do with me or what I'm doing. And I thought that that was unprofessional. And I said, OK, for the time being, I'll respect that. But sooner or later, when the union does come into fruition, he'll take the phone call. So is this just to, I guess, to go pop culture on you, is this Arliss versus Entourage no. right now? Is this HBO? I mean, technically, Arliss was created in a way on your life. From no. what I'm told, <laughs> and Ari Emanuel is is Ari from Entourage. Is this an HBO sort of battle that's going on right I now? I used to just give a bunch of stories to Bob Wolf for his show. I mean, I, that, that's I don't know not, where that okay. ruined, they ran with just that. Just trying idea. to figure this out right here. They ran with that idea, but no, this is about employer versus employee. Okay, that's so you've about. gotten essentially a door slammed in your face. Is what you're saying? For the time being, because right now there is no Professional Fighters Association until we get voted in. Okay, so how do you get that done? 
What's the next step for you, Jeff well, Boris? Th there's roughly 600 fighters in the UFC uh, this last weekend. I think we counted up 577. And you have to get 30% of the membership to sign solicitation cards. So let's just call it 180. At that time, you go to the UFC and you say, will you voluntarily recognize us as a union, as a bargaining agent for the fighters? And what are the odds of that happening? <laughs> Slim to none. I mean, I'm not getting that warm, fuzzy feeling from them. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that that's going to happen. So then we would go ahead and we would submit to the National Labor Relations Board. And then there would be an election. And then the fighters would either vote us in or they wouldn't vote us in. And what do you th so you're saying that some of these fighters are concerned that that if it doesn't happen, I, I guess look, my question for you is this then, Jeff, is that how doesn't it essentially, because it happens in every one of these sports, right? Doesn't it essentially come to the withholding of services and the threatening of it at some point to get something done? And the question is, is how does that happen? Where else would these fighters go? And wouldn't the UFC just go ahead and just keep getting people who are just trying to get fights instead? Well, the right? strength and the leverage that we would have once we become a union is obviously a strike, which would be a, a, what I would call a weapon of last resort. Let's just say we had our first collective bargaining session, and I said, I want to get medical insurance for these guys. Something as simple as so that. So right now there is no, uh, it, unless they're training, right? Unless they're in the midst of training, there's that, that medical services are covered? Right. right. If they have a training-related injury or they get hurt while they're in the octagon, their, their bills would be covered. But if a guy uh, gets bronchitis and needs to go to the doctor, that's not going to be covered. So Nate Diaz in his face right now is covered? That would be covered. Okay. That would be covered. But if Nate Diaz suddenly comes down with a cold, he's got to go ahead and take care of it himself. He's on, he's on his own. So obviously, as I said, a strike would be a last resort, uh, something that we would never want. But there's strength in, in leverage and unity. And that's why having a union with all these fighters, I think we'll be able to get those things that they are sorely in need of. Have you reached out to Conor McGregor? Have you had a conversation with him? I promised I won't say names of okay. anybody. So I will tell you that I've met with the entry level fighters, the guys, the men and women who are making 10 and 10, 10,000 yes. a show and 10,000 right. win all the way up to the top, and I've talked to as many representatives as I can of all the fighters as Jeff, well. Jeff Boris here on the Rich Eisen Show. So um, let's, let's I guess, brass tax it for me here. When, when, when do you need to get your certification done by, do you think, to keep the momentum going now, for you? I, I'm going to Dallas Wednesday, taking a look. I think the certification cards, the solicitation cards will be printed up then. Mm -hmm. And starting on Wednesday, I believe that from the first signature that we get, we have 12 months. So in order to accomplish that, I hope it won't take that long, but I, I'm not sure. Okay. And does this remind you of anything you've ever gone through in your career? Well, in, in baseball, I've been through lockouts, strikes, right. collusion on multiple occasions, unfair labor practice charges. Mm -hmm. So I think I pretty much run the full gamut. Uh, hopefully, if we become a union, there's labor peace. I, 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 I'm a peacetime union organizer, but <laughs> <laughs> a peacetime union organizer. But I like that phrase. I, nevertheless, I, I won't be afraid to fight, as we've done in baseball several times, if, in the event that we don't get what's fair and what's right. So you're saying these guys aren't independent contractors right now? Is that what you're saying right now? And, and ladies, that technically that you don't believe that they are because the way that the UFC business is set up in a way that they're they're not employees of the UFC, right? So Right. In the contract, the UFC has them sign. It says that they're independent contractors, but they're not, and I'll tell you why. They tell the fighters when to fight, who they're going to fight, what they're going to wear when they're fighting, and then they also tell them you're not allowed to fight in any other promotion for any other entity, which is no different than baseball, basketball, football, hockey. They tell them the same, same exact thing. So <laughs> if, if the fighters of the UFC are not employees, then neither are baseball players, basketball players, football players, hockey players. I guess they're not either. It's a very self-serving statement on the part of the UFC by calling them independent contractors and having them sign that in their deals because they're not. What are the odds this gets done without having to go in front of a judge? Go in front of a judge? Yeah. <laughs> well, basically I'm, say that to basically argue these points in a way that that gets argued about. Or is this just a flat out National Labor Relations Board argument that you say in front of them? I'm yeah. just trying to figure this out. Having been through this this sort of lockout wars myself. Yes, I think I think the NLRB will be the ones that will make that decision. decision. Yes. Right. OK. All right. Are you guys, are you just looking at the UFC or are you also looking at other entities like Bellator or Pride? And how important is it for you guys to get other fighters like we had Randy Couture sitting in here last week in that seat 
who has no relationship with the UFC because he tried to do things like unionize, get player benefits. How important is it for you to get those older fighters to maybe talk to some of these younger guys about how important this could be for their careers? I think it's very important for the older fighters to come and talk to the younger fighters because I believe that the fighters of today have a duty of gratitude towards the fighters that came before them as they have a loyalty to the fighters they're fighting against today and the fighters that will come behind them. So I think that's very important. In fact, a fighter brought up to me uh, the possibility that if we were to get pensions, is it possible that we could then designate some retired fighters to give pensions to, like a, a Randy Couture? That would be a, a good example. But for the time being, the only promotion that we're, we're targeting is the UFC fighters. Bellator, possibly in the future, I don't know. But at the time being, it's just limited to the UFC. Last one for you, Jeff Boris. Is it true that a million dollar check was once framed by Ricky Henderson instead of cashed. Is that a true story? <laughs> there's there's a lot of rumors out there about that stuff, but no, that's that's not true. That is not true. I know, and they said that he was he framed it and he was holding it until the interest rates went up before he cashed it, but that's not that true. That is not true. <laughs> no. Is it true that he once <laughs> wow. went up to John Olerud as a member of the Mets teammate saying that he once had a teammate who wore a helmet in the field just like him and Olerud said, well, that was really me, Ricky. Is that a true story? I, you know, I heard actually from Johnny Franco, who I represented he yes. said that that had happened, so I'll defer. <laughs> yes. I'll defer that had happened. We're one for two. So I'm one for two on Ricky Henderson <laughs> rumor story. 500's not a bad average. No, hey, get you in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> right. Thanks for coming on. Good luck to you, Jeff. Thanks for having you me. You bet. Keep, a, uh, keep us posted here. Okay. That's Jeff Boris here on The Rich Eisen Show. The Rich Eisen Show, weekdays at noon Eastern on Audience.